Chris, when you're um, covering the um, the grand pontifical ceremonies that open and close these august events, do you usually have to stand for the three hours? I felt that a little unnerving. <laughs> Crowded in there with a small space and a large number of videographers banging into you with their equipment every five seconds. I think I was concussed for a good part of it. Well, you know, I I, I like the um, the ones that are outside. Where actually where we first met, well, you have room. Yes, All right. You have the room, and you've got the little desk, and that that, yeah. that makes it much more easier. Yep. All right, Michael, we are good to go. Okay, good good afternoon or good evening or whatever time of day you're watching us. This is one of our Go Rebuild forums that we do periodically addressing major issues that affect the church and affect all of us. And this one is especially timely, especially given some of our uh, participating panelists are actually still in the Eternal City. Uh, today's topic is the Synod, what happened, what didn't, and indeed what's next. Now this is the Synod and Synodality, which is just concluded or a couple of days ago in Rome after a month. I want to tell you, first of all, that uh, our webinar today is sponsored by the Center for Catholic Studies at Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, and the Go Rebuild is part of the larger apparatus of the university's outreach in terms of ecclesial reform. Our panelists today are Catherine Clifford. Catherine is Professor of Historical and Systematic Theology, and she's the founding director of the Research Center on Vatican II and 21st Century Catholicism at St. Paul University in Ottawa. She's co-editor with Massimo Faggioli of the Oxford Handbook on Vatican II. And she was a lay synod participant with the delegation of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops to the Synod on Synodality. Welcome, Catherine. Good to be with you, Michael. Uh, next is Chris White. Now, Chris White is the Vatican correspondent for the National Catholic Reporter, and he has been covering the Synod from Rome since Pope Francis launched it in October of 2021. That's a while ago. We all think it just happened. It didn't. It was a long gestation. Chris is also the Vatican analyst for NBC and MSNBC. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. It's great to be with all of you. And Daniel Rober. Dan is Associate Professor and Chair of Catholic Studies at Sacred Heart University. He is trained as a systematic theologian, and he has written on issues covering the relationship of theology to French phenomenology, to the Second Vatican Council, Catholic involvement in political life, and secularization. He's also uh, very fond of certain Canadian Catholic thinkers like Marshall McLuhan and Charles Taylor. That kind of endears him to me. Anyway, this is our panel, and we're going to start off. We're going to be looking at various things. Uh, I'm the facilitator. My name is Michael W. Higgins. I'm the Distinguished Professor of Catholic Thought at Sacred Heart and the inaugural uh, Brazilian uh, Fellow in Contemporary Catholic Thought at uh, St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto. I was in Rome writing a book for the pa for Paulus Press. But the real activists, the ones really on the ground, are, are Catherine and Christopher, and they're going to be the ones informing a great deal of what goes on over the next uh, hour. So welcome. Let's start, first of all, Kathy, with you. Give me one of the highlight, one highlight and one low light of the, your experience of this synod as a synod participant. You were a voting member, so you're unique in recent church history. Um, I think for me, one of the the most amazing days at the synod was the day we got to discuss the question of women's recognition and participation and inclusion in the church and there was like a wind of fresh air that blew through the synod hall and women spoke and women i think were heard um uh it was it was quite remarkable um the whole i mean the whole synod process was this way that 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 we were speaking very freely and very frankly about a whole host of issues but i don't think that um, I, where there we were 54 women participants in the synod, and so this was not people talking about women, but women expressing their own uh, concerns, and that was that, that was a really really. Um, I remember we had a break, and and I just um, I was just moved. Many of us were just really moved that 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 we we got to share our concerns with our our our, our bishops um yeah 
So that was um, a highlight. So, what about yeah, the low light? Highlight. Was there a low light for you? Well, I I think um, as we moved along, and you could see this also in the media outside the synod, of course, but we began to hear voices as we got further into the process and into uh, closer to the the vote uh, the voting on the, and the drafting of a final document. Um, a number there, there's a small minority of voices, but a number of um, b- bishops would speak up and say, "I'm not sure about the status of this synod. This doesn't seem to be a, a synod of bishops anymore, and I don't understand why there's these women and lay people who are here and they have a right to vote." And um, that's uh, you know, after after we were, I think, very graciously and generously welcomed and invited to share very frankly um, at, at the as equals around the table with um, bishops of, of a whole variety of ranks, suddenly our participation seemed to be devalued. And this, this was framed as a kind of attack on the authority of the bishops which I think is a very regrettable way of characterizing what was going on at the Synod, which is um, not a deliberative body, but a consultative one. So um, um, anyway, I could say more about that, but but that's yeah. just, um, it, it was, um, yeah, it was just a little, um, well, it's, 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 a, it's a quite a slight to the many non-Episcopal uh, delegates that were present in the room. Great stuff. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Chris, a highlight and a low light. Uh, I'll start with the low light so we can work our way up. Uh, <laughs> my low light would certainly be uh, sort of day one uh, on October 4th. It was a, the, the morning was remarkable. It began with the mass uh, in St. Peter's Square, uh, and then all the delegates filed into uh, the Synod Hall to begin the discussions. And we, we, have, we have many reporters covering the Senate were keen to find out about what the communication guidelines were going to look like during the Senate. Uh, and so first the Pope uh, spoke and he said, that, you know, um, he gave this address where he asked uh, delegates in the room to fast from certain public words. Um, and so we weren't sure exactly what that meant, but it, you could tell it was his his effort to sort of rein in, um, you know, the, conver- to the conversations w- with um, the media. Uh, and then the, the guidelines for the Senate went out soon after that, where it basically said that Senate delegates were asked to, to be confidential about the nature of the discussions in the room. And while I think that the guidelines themselves actually gave, you know, some... Uh, some flexibility and people, the space for individual members to discern how they wanted to share the experience. I think initially it kind of froze people up because they weren't sure how to navigate the, the sort of murky terrain and these guidelines. Uh, because I think a lot of people had the very good intention of not wanting to undermine the process and they wanted to sort of uh, act within the spirit of, of what the Pope had outlined there. Uh, and so for two years, having asked Catholics from all around the world to be involved in this process and invite them in to share their concerns and to, to listen, when they arrived, you know, when we arrived in this moment, it felt as if, uh, you know, we, those of us that had been covering it, and I think for our readers, they, they'd been cut off to a certain degree from, from the process. Uh, so that, that was a low light, having to just sort of navigate that and learn to tell the story of the Synod uh, sort of, you know, through uh, the guidelines that were put in place for us. Uh, I'm proud of the work we did at NCR covering it. Um, and I just I think uh, going forward next year, because the Synod is happening in two sessions, there should be sort of a reexamining of how the guidelines work and just, you know, some some adjustments, nothing major. Uh, but in terms of the highlight, I have to say it is uh, a smorgasbord of, you know, global Catholicism. Uh, the synods just bring everyone to town. You have, you know, some 450 participants and delegates and experts. Uh, and, you know, you can have one conversation with someone from Australia and they can tell you about their own experience in synodality and, and the, through the plenary council. Or, and then five minutes later, end up in a conversation uh, with someone from Nigeria who says, she says to me that, look, my village has long practiced synodality through palaver and our methods of talking to one another in, in that format. And now my church is practicing it. 
so where else are you going to get that sort of on the ground training and exposure? And, you know, I think, you know, if lawyers practice, you know, if they do like CLEs in continuing legal yeah. education for, for, for journalists, this is, you know, some some real serious on the ground training. And, and that was a real gift. Thank you, Chris. Now, Dan, um, Kathy and, and Chris were covering the event in Rome as it was happening. You, along with the other 1.4 billion Catholics, were actually looking at it from the outside. You were in your studio in downtown New York. So what did you think of this? What's the highlight and what's the low light covering it from a distance? But then again, you're a professional theologian. So you have vested interest in this. Thank you, Michael. So I think the highlight for me would be uh, frankly, the existence of the synod in the way that, that it went, and I think particularly the symbolism and reality of the Pope participating as a member of discussion groups in the synod, um, rather than simply presiding over it. Um, I thought that was an important, um, and again, Francis is traded in these uh, important symbolic gestures, uh, right, that have kind of long-term uh, I think import, but even if sometimes they uh, don't produce the short term uh, results that people might be expecting in quite the order they would like. But I think this, the symbolism of uh, the Pope as a participant in these discussions, as uh, being somebody who is there as a member of the faithful in addition to, or maybe more importantly than being the Pope, um, has real significance both for this synod and for the broader uh, pursuit of synodality, which is something that I think Francis hopes will bring uh, the church into better conversation and unity, especially with um, Eastern churches that have had long traditions of synodality uh, that, and less top-down and hierarchical structures. Uh, than the Catholic Church developed, especially through the Middle Ages. So I think that kind of decentering of the Pope um, and allowing the Synod to have those conversations uh, was particularly important. Um, and I guess that kind of goes along with the low light, which for me, um, like Kathy, also gets into some of the media framing. Of course, not the media framing by Chris White, but... Uh, some of the media framing of the Synod, both in kind of the mainstream press, but also especially in, I think, uh, kind of conservative Catholic press and media um, focused on, uh, and I, we may have time to talk about this later, focus on what I would call the sort of teleology of the Synod, of sort of like, what is the Synod going to produce? Uh, when I think, certainly for Pope Francis, the process is the point at this juncture. Um, mm -hmm. And also um, related to that, right, the attempted sabotage of the Synod uh, beforehand, which I've written about by the Cardinals who wrote the Dubia, right, of trying to make the discussion around the Synod a referendum on Francis and his papacy or his initiatives, um, either to get people angry um, and upset about the Synod itself, or in some cases to kind of dismiss it. I saw a conservative media article uh, talking about it as the nothing burger Synod uh, the other day, right? And that's to the same thing, right? To attempt to discredit and diffuse. Uh, so that was disappointing. Although again, that is sort of a meta question to the Synod itself. Um, because I was not involved um, as Kathy was at the Synod itself, I'd, it would be hard to pronounce um, on some of the details, um, although we will talk about those. So thank you. But one of, one of the details you, you raised, Dan, is very good in terms of the optics and the Pope's presence in the aula. Kathy, you you were in the aula with, with, with the Pope. Tell, for, our, for our watchers um, and listeners, what was, what was it like? Did he circulate among the tables? Did he sit at the same table? Tell us something about the Pope's presence in the Alba. So, so um, the Synod was organized in stages. So at the beginning of each new step or stage in the process, we would have a day, a morning, that would begin with a lit liturgy celebrated together, um, usually presided by a different continental group in different languages. Uh, we had a, a, a one celebration with the uh, in the Byzantine uh, uh, liturgical tradition as well. Then we would 
go together and there would be some speakers. Um, often Timothy Radcliffe um, uh, would give a kind of spiritual exhortation to the members of the synod. Um, often some theological input as well. And every time we had a plenary session like this, and those opening sessions of each new stage were live streamed for anyone who wanted to follow them. Every time we had a plenary session, Francis was present, unless like on Wednesday morning, he had his, the, the, the general audience um, in the St. Peter's Square. Uh, but in, in most, uh, most of the plenary sessions, Francis was present. So this would be at the beginning of this, each uh, uh, working stage. Then we would begin and we would, we would work for about two and a half days in small groups, um, uh, reflecting on a set of questions. And after a day and a half, we would produce a small report that was shared in the plenary session. And Francis would come back for those plenary sessions and listen to the 35 reports from the 35 working groups. And, and then there were free interventions for individuals who wanted to intervene um, on these same topics. And he was very engaged and followed all of this very, very closely. Um, and at the end, uh, when the we, were, we're, we received the final document and we spent an afternoon voting on that final text, and uh, uh, each participant voted on each of the individual 350 paragraphs, Francis was at the, he, he was staying at the main table, but Francis voted and he <laughs> He came and he voted like every other participant in the Synod. And he was up on and had received the draft text. And then we we had some chance to have some input and there was some revision. So he saw the final version um, on the same at the same time that the rest of us would have seen it. So uh, he was remarkable for good goodness for a, a man of his age. He has remarkable energy because these were long days. And um, on on two or three occasions, he addressed the synod participants directly. Um, one day near the end, um, and I think that text was made pu uh, public also, he had a, 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 a substantial intervention on the importance of recovering the understanding of the church as the people of God. And the subtext of this was also, this was part of um, still correcting the imbalances that were giving rise to the culture of clericalism in the church. Uh, yeah, so I, I just want to—I uh, just want you to, to say something about that, and maybe Chris can as well. That that intervention, which mm -hmm. you're quite right, I mean, we all have the text for that, um, was a celebration of the holy, faithful people of God, uh, the mm -hmm. laity, but also it was a scorching uh, attack on clericalism, and it became actually rather particular in the sense that he lamented young clergy and seminarians spending a great deal of time uh, buying elves and. Uh, uh, lace ecclesiastical garb. I mean, it had a strong personal tonality about it. What, was he driven to make this intervention because of some frustration um, over uh, the discussion around clericalism and priestly formation? Or was he just, it was just an off day for him and he just decided to um, uh, to excori <laughs> excoriate the, the clerics who betray them? vocation. He does this regularly, of course. We've had, over the last 10 years, we've had about several occasions, scrum-like or in, in a formal instance talking to seminary rectors where he kind of lets loose. But this this was unusual because it was the uh, the plenary assembly and it seemed to come out of nowhere. How did you read it? And then, Chris, how did you read it? So, um, a recurrent theme in our discussions was concern about seminary formation and, and to become a more synodal church, one that makes uh, more space for letting there be more uh, active participation and co-responsibility on the part of the la laity and collaboration in a, in a wider diversity of ministries as well. Um, uh, means we have to rethink our model of training priests. And and uh, um, some of the most um, conservative um, members of the clergy and where there's, a, a, I think, a strong resistance to this recovery of, of a synodal culture in the church is found among young people. And I think Francis is very mindful of this. Now, Ironically, two days after he made this speech, there was a, a protest 
that came up the Via della Conciliazione of a bunch of young men in satans with lace surplices. And, and um, they were, they were um, this was a protest in favor of the restoring the Latin uh, liturgy. And, and so, I mean, <laughs> look, it's here. It's here all around us. <laughs> it's, it's and a, so well, he, he I, is the Bishop I think of he Rome. Knows a, there a, are a more, he speaks. more shops for ecclesiastical finery, more ecclesiastical haberdashers in Rome than anywhere else on the planet. Uh, Chris, what did you think of this intervention? <clears throat> Yeah, I, th I think back to when Catherine was talking about, you know, the, the low point for her, and it was th those that began to sort of question the the authority of the Synod. Uh, and I think the Pope's response was a, a direct response to that. Um, and I think it, we know that in a sense, by the fact that the Pope asked for the intervention to be made public. I mean, he had intervened, as we know, at several points throughout the month, including my understanding, at least it's his very first intervention on day one or day two was about seminary formation. Uh, and then, you know, for him to then come back at the end of the Senate and to respond to the critics, uh, to, to answer uh, their 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 efforts to undermine the, the Senate and the authority of it. Uh, and his words um, also came on the same day that Cardinal Grech, who's the organizer of the Synod, uh, said that the Synod is, does not only have the authority of every other Synod of bishops, it enhances the Synod's authority because it includes that of the whole people of God. Uh, so I, I think, in a sense, it was their closing argument. <laughs> I think that was a point also made by Timothy Ratcliffe and a few others about how, in some respects, this was more Episcopal than the narrowly defined Episcopal synods themselves. Mm -hmm. Dan, did you uh, read that intervention from the Pope, that broadside? Yes, I did see that. And I think that's here in the United States on the ground, I think, is um, it really illustrates the disconnect uh, that you see between um, a lot of the kind of everyday life of, especially the institutional church here. I don't want to say the everyday life of the church, because that's, of course, much broader. Uh, but, right, for so many Catholics in the United States, the reality is uh, that these young men who go to these uh, ecclesiastical finery stores in Rome, right, are their pastors um, and are not particularly responsive to synodality um, and to Pope Francis. And I think this is one of the major uh, kind of disconnects going on. Again, it's easy to talk about that in the Episcopal level about the, the con conference of bishops. Uh, but I think increasingly on the ground in the way that par Catholics are encountering their parish life, um, that is a particularly relevant um, critique, but one that's also um, tricky to navigate. Yeah, I should mention at this point, too, we have a couple of hundred additional people who are watching this online right now. So uh, this is a good sign that, you know, the 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 concerns raised around and like it seems a matter of some flummery, some inconsequential thing to be talking about cassocks and berettas and whatnot. But it's because it's symbolic mm -hmm. uh, that that it becomes uh, it's elevated to a different level of, of uh, some intensity. And during the course of the uh, month that you were both present in Rome, and addressing this particularly to Kathy and Chris right now, um, you, we were reminded, and I was there as well, but we were reminded about custody of the tongue, fasting of the word, and, and most people seem to be quite discreet about that and to exercise good prudential judgment, sometimes under some uh, concern about the, the, precisely the issue that Chris outlined, that large numbers of Catholics had invested in the process for at least a year or two years, and they weren't seeing any, any evidence of how this was unfolding. Having said that, there were people who broke rank, and the cardinal prefect of the Dicastria bishops, an American, actually in a press briefing, uh, reprimanded uh, uh, cardinals or others who actually gave interviews. How how did you how did you see this? I mean, if you're, uh, there are people kind of <laughs> breaking the guideline here, uh, what what and their leaders? What does that uh, say about trust in the process, Chris? And then Kathy. Uh, I'll say a few things. I mean, by my count, we only saw during the course of the Senate itself only. Uh, less than you know less than half a dozen uh interviews from uh 
from cardinals or bishops in the room that spoke about the nature of the, the, the discussions and that attempted to kind of put their thumb on the scale. Uh, we did have interviews from a number of people that attested to the experience, uh, mm -hmm. but I would say it was a very few numbers of those that really sought to put their thumb on the scale wh where you felt as if their interventions came at a particular time leading up to the votes, leading out, up to the, the draft documents. Uh, so I was much more curious about the, the, the timing of, of, of when some of these interviews dropped than anything else. Um, because it didn't seem to be in the spirit of the whole thing. Um, you know, the, the, I, I do think it's important as a journalist for people to speak because I think the Senate is best understood through the experience rather than the text that it cre creates or produces. And so, I, you know, to a certain extent, I, I don't want to shame people for speaking because I'm grateful that they did. Um, and so I'm grateful for, the, for those that were willing to speak, uh, but to also respect the confidential nature of the proceedings. Um, so I don't want to wag my finger too much, but I do think the Catholics that were listening to these interviews by those that were trying to sort of cast doubts on the Synod, um, you know, I, I, I fear that they, they may be manipulated by the, you know, the very narrow perspective that they're getting from what took place over the last month. Yes, he, um, in, in the aula itself, of course, um, uh, what what was the the temper or the mood? I mean, thirty days um, is a significant period of time, and certainly um, for uh, Chris and myself, at the press briefings, um, whenever they had the guests come out, and you were one of them, of course, particularly with a focus on ecumenism, um, everybody talked about how wonderful the experience was. I mean, it was kind yeah. of a consistent script. There's no there's no reason to contest that. There's no reason to believe that people didn't believe what they said. But but there must have been some tension, some tension when you put hundreds of people in a room during, for thirty days to discuss issues of great consequence for the life of the church, um, and, and that tension can be good. It can be generative, right? It can it produce ideas. I mean, collision of Catholic intellect with Catholic intellect was Newman's idea of how truth moves forward. So were were there moments of tension that you remember that were both positive? And negative in the aula. I, I would say, of course, there were, and I would say, um, um, the atmosphere evolved as we moved through the process. And mm -hmm. and and I think Dan's observation is really um, an important one. That process is even much more important than the results here. I think this was a kind of school for bishops, and to help, it was this was aimed at helping all of us simply learn how to listen. And, and the kind of process that we followed was a kind of ascetical form of listening. You get three minutes, nobody's gonna react, nobody's gonna judge your input, but then you have to listen and give everybody else the same uh, chance to speak. And then we're gonna all just um, take a moment and say, what, do, what are we hearing? What is it that's moving us? What is it that's speaking us to us? So, um, and the, the goal was not to paper over the differences or the divergences in our points of view. And I think that's also really important because we have not had creative spaces for conversation and dissent in the Catholic world for decades. Um, and and uh, so I would also say, I remember like when we arrived and when we began all of this, a lot of bishops were very nervous about the process. They were very skeptical. And, and um, uh, but at, the more we entered into it, the more they could relax. And we, of course, were, were living together in, in residences all around the city. We're, we're sharing meals together. We're, we're walking to work in the morning together. And, and, um, so we became we became more and more of a community as we went further along, and um, it was I think just helpful to know that we could disagree vehemently about things and still respect each other. That's good um, to know. Well, well, this was going on in the synod hall. Mm -hmm. Of course, there was an alternate synod or a parallel synod, 
that it was also unfolding on the ground. And uh, Chris was at it. I had, I had attended as well with uh, fairly eminent figures like Joan Chittister the, and Mary McAleese, the former president of uh, the Republic of Ireland, but quite a number of theologians. Um, and they were there uh, not to undermine the synod uh, outside the walls. They, they were there to understand what's going on inside the walls. It seemed to me that they were companions along the way. I, I attended several of their sessions, and although they could be fiery, I never found them particularly adversarial. And I suspect that they, they, they reminded the delegates who were in the hall, like yourself, that the issues around LGBTQ+, plus, um, human rights issues, women in ministry, they were more pressing for them than they would be for the synod delegates because the synod delegates are dealing with the universal church. And so they, they're not as necessarily as focused on a particular issue. Chris, what was your read of the of these parallel synodal moments? Well, I think there are always um, synods that take place inside the room, the sort of official synod, and then synods that take place outside <laughs> The, the hall, or at least the stories that take place out, outside the hall that, that do have, uh, you know, to some effect, um, shape the discussions inside the hall, or that at least that's the, the goal. Uh, I would say this in a, you know, the, the, the outside events seem to be a bit more muted than, than the past synods that I've covered. Oh, yes. Uh, and I think part of that, in a sense, is it might be because for two years, Catholics have already been invited into the process. And so that they, you know, they're given a chance to have their say all along. Now, I, I think, I, and I certainly understand the, the need to have a personal presence and witness here in Rome during during the events themselves. Um, but I, I mean, I, I do want to kind of lean into what, what Kathy was saying about the positive experience that people were having inside the room, because I think we did see sort of moments of real conversion for those that were skeptical of the process. And in the past, I would say those that had been skeptical of the process or were worried about, you know, doctrine being undermined, I think they fed things outside of the room to a greater extent than we saw in this synod. I mean, of course, the, the Pachamama incident during the, uh, the the 2019 synod on the Amazon, where these indigenous statuettes were thrown into the Tiber kind of symbolized that. Um, but I, I do think that the, the growing sense of, of, of unity, uh, you know, and, or not so much unity, but communion inside the Senate Hall uh, helped lessen the divisions outside of the Senate Hall uh, to a certain extent. Oh, that's very illuminating, I think. Uh, Dan, you want to uh, come in on here? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I think... And, and I think because that conversation obviously extends, obviously there were events going on in Rome, but there's also conversations going on um, back in the local churches and also I think um, online. But I think your point is very well taken, right? That the, the synod is a result of um, all of these consultations that have been done of people having uh, some input um, and I think I think that is one of the things that leads to uh, some degree of agitation, right, for results, um, even though as we, that's not necessarily the way, um, especially this year, um, the Synod is structured. And I think that's also where the critique that I saw in some places, especially on the right, of the Synod as a kind of collection of um, elites or uh, people who are unrepresentative um, was quite unfair, both in the sense that a wider variety of people are being represented uh, than at past synods, uh, but also that by nature, right, to have these kinds of conversations, there have to be some people who have the time and bandwidth to go and participate in extended conversations, and those people are more likely going to be what some people derogatorily call professional Catholics, right, of people for whom this is their bread and butter, um, but I think that's an unfair critique in the sense that it's it's clear that there were a wide variety of perspectives uh, being brought to bear. Um, so, but I, again, I think these sort of parasynods are helpful in the sense of focusing on things that might not be getting focused on inside and continuing the conversation in a way that parallels what we saw at Vatican II, in which the Synod hopes to follow up on, of generating a church that is in conversation about things. 
uh, and moving away from what Kathy described as a kind of chill of this conversation over the last several decades. There were uh, particular occasions, too, when uh, people outside the Senate wanted to shape the narrative of what was going on in the Senate. And you yeah. could see this at press briefings when they would ask particular delegates who were present to respond to specific questions. And one of them, of course, that surfaced regularly were, were questions, again, around sexual orientation, uh, same-sex blessing, uh, the role of the German synod and things like that. But one of the uh, points that, um, that, that struck me is, is in all these um, conversations and uh, around uh, these kinds of, of matters, there, 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 was, there was some opacity, there was some confusion. Uh, the conservatives were looking for clarity, but clarity for them was grounded specifically in a rather univ univocal and narrow interpretation of the tradition. The progressives were interested in expanding this, but this, at the same time, however, the people in the Senate Hall have to address the fact that it is a universal or global gathering of Catholics. One uh, political scientist from the United States made the observation that on the summary report or the synthesis report that appeared at the end, there was no mention of LGBTQ rights, whatever, but they did mention the pastoral challenges facing polygamy in Africa. For the political scientist, um, this was an indication of a shift of power from, from Europe and from the United States or North America to the New World, particularly to Africa. Is that a fair uh, reading of it, uh, uh, Kathy? You were in the hall. You were I there think, when I they were crafting that synth synthesis report. I, th I think that's a bit of a misreading. Um, I, I think also, um, I think neither the people on the left or people on the right get what was going on inside the synod hall. And the, you know, the, the meetings that were taking place here out, uh, in the city during the synod, um, um, some of them were mocking the synod and claimed that people inside the synod weren't free to speak. That was not true. Um, and I think that needs to be made pretty clear. The, the, the way this functioned and, and Francis requests that we not divulge um, the details of the conversation inside the room was a kind of practicing Chatham House rules so that it would allow people to have the freedom to speak. And you knew journalists and anybody who wanted to, to find out, you, you could tell what we were discussing from day to day. You had the working documents, you had our agenda, and you could see what was being discussed from day to day, no question. Um, and, and, but Francis also said in his remarks, you know, um, it's still important to communicate and to communicate well. So a lot, was invested in those press conferences to have panels of representative synod participants. And what we shared was um, helping people understand the process. And because this is a very new uh, way of, 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 of um, proceeding inside the synod hall. So that in itself, I think, um, was, was important. Uh, but neither, neither was it correct to represent the synod and the people in the hall as being interested in setting aside the tradition of the church. Everyone in the hall loves the church and is here to serve the church. And there are hard questions for which may, we may not have satisfying answers for everybody, but instead of shutting down the discussion, we've said, these are open questions. These are open questions. And that, that, that touches especially a nerve with people when we get to issues of human sexuality or women's ministry, for example. So the acronym LGBTQ does not appear in the final synodal report. It was in the synthesis document and in many of the continental reports. Um, it was discussed very frankly and very openly. And I think the, 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 the diversity of perspectives and they're very, very far apart, but there's an acknowledgement in this final report that this issue of how we respond pastorally and welcome those of, uh, same, of, of different uh, genders or different sexual orientations in the church is, still is here in front of us and has to be faced. 
I think that that's fair and very important distinctions people are making there. There was one case, Chris, I wonder if you were at the press briefing at the, there were so many of them, um, uh, where uh, Franz Josef uh, Overbeck, the Bishop of Essen, um, was responding specifically again to some questions concerning the German city, but he was also talking about the devastating consequences and lingering consequences of clerical sex abuse in his diocese. And um, he was very frank about this. There was a there was a refreshing candor about that conversation. Do you remember it? I do. And I, I think um, I think it would be a mistake to categorize the whole synod process as a response to clergy sex abuse. Um, but it, I think it is fair to view it as a response to clergy sex abuse and, and an effort for the church to regain its credibility. And I think you know, one of the, one of the many reasons why the church has had such broad institutional failings on abuse uh, is, is by not listening <laughs> to everyone, uh, especially uh, mothers uh, and especially the voices of women in this, and listening only to bishops. And synodality uh, can, can can serve as a corrective to that. Um, and I, I think you know, in places like Australia, places like Germany, where they've had you know such devastating um, you know recent past uh, related to abuse, synodality has approved, proven to be, you know, an effective means to begin, to, to begin, not to, not to solve, to begin uh, to correct for that. That's good. I'll, I'll just ask one question for you, Dan, and then we better go to the question and answer period, because we've only got about 15 minutes left. Um, and that is, uh, again, speaking about the synodal process, Cardinal Schoenbrunn, uh, who was there from uh, from Vienna, made a comment that I thought was really quite illuminating. He he alluded to, um, I think, I, I didn't get the name, so I think a British um, uh, a political scientist, very distinguished science, political scientist, observed that if the Security Council at the UN were to follow the synodal process that he has seen unfolding in, um, in Rome, we would perhaps have a much safer world and the stalemate that constantly persists in the Security Council would be shattered. So um, Sean Bunn was quite taken by that because he was uh, somebody from outside looking at the synodal process and saying this could be a model for human discourse and political unfolding. Now that may be a little over the top and romantic, but it seems to me that it's actually grounded in some truth. What do you think? So I think that this touches on something that I've been thinking about in terms of sort of the broader discourse about the synod um, that relates to um, some issues that come up in, in US politics. Cause I was thinking about the conversation we were just having about the issues of responsiveness to LGBTQ plus people and um, the clerical sex abuse scandal, right? As those are both sets of issues that people are justifiably very angry about uh, because people have been personally had their lives destroyed by these things, um, but the, the attitude of the church on these issues. Um, and Francis has made a lot of symbolic gestures, uh, particularly on the LGBTQ sets of issues to try to um, make people feel welcome. And some surrounded the Senate itself, uh, the welcoming of uh, Janine Gramic, for example, who had previously been silenced. Um, but I think one of the things about the Synod that is fascinating, but sometimes frustrating to people is that Francis doesn't want to govern the church by executive order, right? And this is something that I think is an interesting relationship to the way US politics plays out. So uh, for those watching uh, from around the world, um, right, one of the things that's been very clear in the US context is political gridlock, where Congress can't get a lot done. Uh, so last night there was a whole Senate session with Republican senators yelling at one another about confirming generals or not. Um, Right. And that's a fairly basic thing for national security, you know, confirming new generals to uh, their roles. Um, and so executive order, right, things the president can do on his or someday her own, right, uh, begins to look appealing, right, as a way to just get around uh, the gridlock of disagreement and the real dysfunction that exists in the Congress. But of course, that's not very sustainable because governing by executive order means the next person could just change everything. And I think Francis uh, 
in pursuing synodality and in setting up this model for conversation and for a church uh, on pilgrimage together is trying to get away from the idea that the Pope um, should dictate everything. The Pope sets the tone in important ways as Francis has tried to do, but these are things that we have to figure out together. Um, and that leads to uncomfortable conversations, uh, but that lead, but that those uncomfortable conversations can also lead to places that are less toxic than um, if the kind of big chief, you know, the big, you know, um, uh, you know, the Pope has to kind of hand things down to us, right? Um, it, I think it leads to more sustained uh, ways of being together and of finding ways forward. So I and agree. Being, and yeah. being a mature church, I mean, the, yes. the term synod, right? Synodus means walking together. And, and yes. clearly, uh, people like Kathy, you've been walking with the people in the aula, Chris has been covering it for the larger Catholic world because we're all walking together in some important way. And I think uh, Dan is absolutely right. Uh, Francis has set the tone. This is uh, Francis's project in some ways. I mean, he's, he's not alone. Other people, have, of course, uh, been speaking about and building on the principles of synodality and co-responsibility and collegiality and some of these related tangential matters for some time. But it is Francis that made it happen. And so... Now that we're coming to the end of this part of our conversation, because we should be wrapping up shortly, Dan, are there questions you can field from the students in the, the studio that would be helpful right now? Because I'm sure they have some. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have students, faculty, and staff here. Oh, so good. do we have some questions? We have a question. Hi, this is Brian Stiltner um, from the Theology of Religious Studies Department. Um, I was, well, both Dan and I, I think, through an invitation um, through our one of our professional um, Catholic theology societies, got a chance in the summer to participate in a synod re reflection. I think all the documents and stuff were pretty much done, but it still was a great way for me and colleagues to plug into the process. And, and just we had that kind of, you know, an hour and a half online of that kind of process of some listening and sharing thoughts and some bishops were there to kind of hear and just take this added just everything they were bringing but I, I guess I've kind of heard or experienced I didn't feel like in my diocese or my parish I just heard a lot about this and I think it probably varied all around the world and around the U.S. but did that depend a lot on a bishop kind of the local bishop being interested in kind of encouraging local priests and parishes to kind of have a conversation or something did it, did it depend on priests did it depend would, did it vary by country or more by diocese or parish? That's a very important question, Brian. Good to see you. You want to respond to that, Kathy, Chris, because it, it, it is the, uh, the hub of the issue, isn't it? Um, how do you take back now this uh, excitement and fervor generated by experiencing, experiencing yourself, synodality? How do the bishops take it back and implement it in their diocese over the course of the next year? So I think it's important to acknowledge it's been spotty. I mean, um, and and uh, and that that would apply on on every continent, and that many bishops are very ambivalent about this. But I think it's important to underline this is not just Francis' idea. Francis consults the bishops, and when they were asked what they wanted the themes for the synod, the International Synod of Bishops to be, they named synodality is one of the top to topics. So he's responding to a request by the bishops around the world who want to see, who want to be closer to their people and who want to take their co-responsibility more seriously. Um, I think uh, also I would say one of the weakest continental processes in the stages of consultation was in North America. Because, because of the ambivalence of so many bishops, uh, particularly in the US, but also in regions of Canada. Um, so the richest uh, uh, continent in the world, their conferences of bishops says, we don't have the time or the money to get together in person. <laughs> so, so we look really silly next to the other continental processes uh, to, when we see what happened in Africa, in Asia, 
in Europe and Latin America. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do. And one of the jobs of all of us who've been at the Synod is to go back to our local churches this year and talk it up. And 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 the, the bishops will be talking to their in the plenaries of the conferences of bishops. And, and the, we're all challenged to say, look, this is not a one-off. And, and we have to begin now doing this. No bishop can go to an international synod without listening to their people before they go. Thank you. Uh, Chris? I'll, I'll, I'll echo so much of what uh, Kathy just said. Uh, you know, I think uh, you look in different directions and you see different type of responses. And in, in the U.S. church, uh, you know, it's uh, the leadership, at, I think, of, of the of the U.S. bishops. It's just been a very tepid response to, to synodality. I mean, you have folks like Bishop Flores, who I think has done a, a, a pretty heroic and hands on job of steering this through in, in a conference uh, that has put a lot of roadblocks and obstacles in, in his way, uh, including at the very top. Um, I was struck on Monday, you know, the day after the Senate ended, I, uh, I had lunch with uh, one of the, the members, uh, one of the, the lay members from Africa, uh, from Ghana. And she, I said, so what's next? How's it going to be implemented? And she said, oh, well, I've got a plan. Um, uh, we're having a meeting next week. And <laughs> I, I, I've asked every diocese to send two representatives um, and we're going to sort of share our experience. And then each diocese is going to be uh, asked to have two representatives from every parish uh, to sort of manage the process for the next year. So, she, I mean, she was already moving forward to take what happened here in Rome and translate it to a local uh, context. Um, the U.S. bishops, you know, speak, uh, meet later this month um, and we'll see um, what comes out of that. So. There was a question just before I get to Dan for his response. There was a question from Christopher Lamb, who's actually a member of our Go Rebuild uh, team, um, asking, uh, I think it was Archbishop Grolio, who is the president of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, why synodality didn't even appear on the agenda of the last meeting of the of the bishops. And uh, Archbishop Grolio's response was, was unusual in that he said, well, it was on the executive and the executive doesn't share the agenda. So if you have an item as of this importance that's not shared among the bishops or becomes a point of discussion, it does suggest a problem at the institutional heart of that operation. Dan, what do you think? Yes, and I, th I think this is um, indicative of one of, the, one of the challenges around kind of ecclesial polarization in the United States that has paralleled the political polarization. Um, and again, it goes back to some of what I was talking about with the Pope Francis's critique of the young priests and all that, right? Um, in that it is this kind of imbalance in that um, where you tend to find the energy behind this um, is either in places with uh, bishops who are often appointed by Francis who um, you know, attempt to uh, bring that energy to their diocese, um, or often parishes that are uh, religious order parishes. I attend a Jesuit parish, for example, uh, where there was lots of discourse about the synod. Uh, but it becomes very spotty according to sort of various um, vagaries of kind of age and um, ideology and all these different kinds of things that don't necessarily reflect level of interest among the actual Catholics, were they to be presented with this um, in a straightforward way? I think we have time only for one more very quick question before we wrap up here. Um, Dan, do you want to monitor the floor there and take one more question? Yeah, Lars? Amanda has the mic. Amanda has the mic. Did Amanda run away with the mic? Or? No, no. That we're, we're, it's a little, uh, it's a little bit, a little bit of a quiet crowd. It's it's minute. a little bit of a quiet crowd. Well, we only have a couple of minutes left before the the matter ends. Perhaps we could do just a quick uh, summary of this. The synod appears on almost every category and almost every category as a success. But of course, success um, has to be measured by various consequences, right? What are the outcomes? And we kind of alighted on a couple of that already, a couple of those already. 
Do you want to end by just simply saying something in terms of how the synod affected you personally, not professionally, but personally? Is this a model of church that we want to live in the in the future, or is this a blip on the papal landscape? Start with you, Catherine, because you were right in the heart of it. <laughs> Yeah, I was very moved to be invited, very moved to participate. I spent my career um, as a as a theologian and a scholar and uh, I think a supporter, a formator of people in leadership in the church, um, raising many of the questions that we were debating um, and and um, to see um but when I sat next to um, one of the uh, fraternal delegates, a woman from the Baptist World Alliance, um, oh, yes. who said to me, you should be so happy. Look at the voting. The bishops have got massively behind France's project to renew and reform the church. This is for me like the answer to his invitation and in the joy of the gospel of 10 years ago to say, to invite us to re-examine all the structures and practices of the church and say, how are they functioning? Are they, do they continue to serve the mission of the church? And if not, what do we need to do better? And this is like a new reception of the Second Vatican Council. Um, so, um, and the agenda, if you look at the, the Synod report, it looks rather bland, but my goodness, if we actually did and carried out those 81 recommendations, this would be, give the whole church a makeover from top to bottom. And uh, the, 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 the work of doing that will take a generation. But um, so, so we won't see the results of this overnight, but um, I think um, stay tuned. This is a remarkable moment, a remarkable turning point and transition in the life of the church. I was surprised too and really heartened by the fact that several senior prelates uh, said exactly the same thing. We're looking at the making of a new church, of living a different church. That's a remarkable level of investment from senior officers, one would be inclined to think would not be so keen on a radical reordering of the church. Chris? Uh, as a reporter, I try to keep myself out of the story, uh, but I'll, I'll just say both in October of uh, 21, when the Pope uh, first opened the Synod uh, here in Rome, uh, to the opening of it uh, here this just last month, uh, it was impossible not to feel a certain buzz and energy and excitement that something historic is taking place. Uh, so on a personal level, to, to be able to have a front row seat to that and cover it uh, is, is just a, something I'm very grateful for. Uh, you know, I think for two years, people have really invested in it. Uh, there's the challenge of the year in between for there not to become uh, for for a synod fatigue not to set in. Uh, so I'm curious to see how that uh, affects the the dialogue and discourse in the year ahead. Uh, but I'm really excited for next year once we once we get a bit more sleep and rest uh, between now and then. That's, that's, that's it. Yeah, fatigue is the operative word indeed. Dan, you have the last word on this. So um, during October, while while the synod was taking place. Um, I went to a family potluck at my parish in the in the basement of the church, and I, I was struck by the the parallels between the kind of seating layout um, at that event and and the seating layout at the synod, as I discussed earlier, um, with the you know with the Pope sitting down among the people and all this, and and I think that's an interesting way of thinking about what synodality and what what Francis is trying to push us toward as a church to having the higher levels of the church parallel um, a, a kind of, you know, small time event where everyone is invited and everyone is able to contribute um, according to their identities and their needs. And uh, I think, I think that's a real positive. And I think that's also a good rejoinder to um, those who, again, would, would view the Synod as not adequately representing uh, perhaps uh, families or other groups of people, even though, of course, there could be more done in that area. Good point, Dan, and a good way to end. Um, I should say, too, that in addition to um, Kathy and um, Dan and Brian Stokner, the one who posed the question, 
people like David Gibson, I think, Chris, he was in, in Rome for this as well, right? And Colleen Duell, uh, they're also uh, regular bloggers for Go Rebuild. And I think you're going to see on Go Rebuild over the next number of months, our contributors or bloggers carrying on the uh, the narrative that Chris is talking about in terms of uh, the changes and the dynamic in, involved in how one implements this. But it is, as, as Kathy says, of course, really a generational matter, but everything has to have a beginning and we're in at the gestation and that's uh, that's exciting. So I wanna thank uh, Kathy, I wanna thank Chris and Dan uh, for being part of this uh, forum. I think we're one of the first um, universities uh, in North America to actually have something like this so quickly after the Synod had concluded. So we're very fortunate to be able to have had so many of our people on site and already blogging on this. I understand that this is going to be available on YouTube. Is that correct? Um, yes. You know? uh, yeah, Dan. So that if people wish to use this for parish discussions or to get caught up on some of the uh, materials and some of the issues being discussed, um, you're more than welcome to access it. We're, we're fortunate in having people who, like Christopher, who was there as a reporter, Catherine, who's there as a Senate voting Senate delegate. So this, I hope, has been uh, an illuminating and rewarding session webinar for all of you. And on behalf of Sacred University, Go Rebuild and the Center for Catholic Studies, um, I want to thank you for, for tuning in.